Europe has become one of the epicenters of the COVID-19 crisis in the last couple of months. Nationwide shutdowns have affected almost all European countries. There has been a strong impact on all modes of transport. I am happy to welcome the mayor of Tirana, Irion Veliaic. He is a cycling advocate. Albania has tough restrictions regulating the public life to prevent the spread of the virus. How have these restrictions affected life in Tirana and how will they affect your city in the long run? This has been an incredible time, an incredible time to learn uh, but also an incredible time to innovate. Uh, first, we realized that it had been almost a century since this country, but all of Europe went through such a pandemic. So there was no people around who were the living knowledge on how you deal with these things. Other pandemics or other similar issues like MERS or SARS um, or Ebola either were too limited in faraway places for knowledge to have penetrated our system uh, so that we could have been equipped with the right knowledge. So it was mostly learning by doing. I think uh, getting the first things uh, right and believing in science and in facts and not in fake news and in urban legends was extremely important. And once we got a central government together with all the municip municipalities that acted very fast on the lockdown and got local uh, citizen organizations to collaborate, whether it was the local building administration or a neighborhood watch or different associations, uh, including state authorities like the medical uh, field and, and the police, um, it worked uh, like a Swiss clock. Everybody um, applied the tough rules and Albania turned up to have um, about 30 some losses in a population of about 3 million. So um, 10 per million, which was one of the lowest uh, loss counts um, in all of Europe. And I thought that was fantastic, this sense of discipline. Now, mind you, we live in the Mediterranean. Discipline is not necessarily our forte, uh, but it turned out that when we get our act together, when we collaborate, uh, we can really, really uh, pull it off. Um, but it did have an impact, no doubts about it. Schools were interrupted, so we had to be very creative about going immediately online uh, so that kids could follow up their courses and they could be homeschooled uh, through long distance uh, learning. Economic life, like I said, we're in the Mediterranean, 300 days of sunshine, everybody loves to be out and about in clubs and bars and restaurants, uh, that unfortunately, that lifestyle uh, was interrupted very abruptly. But I think it was very important for the city to act immediately in terms of cutting the losses. So we uh, deleted all of the tax uh, obligations for um, everybody working in the sectors that were uh, affected. And then the government actually subsidized the missing salaries uh, for those two very strict uh, months. We had to cut down on public transport. We, of course, had to ban uh, gatherings. Uh, but for some minimal uh, interaction, for example, like going to the market, we had to come up with some innovations. Uh, I was happy we were the first city to come up with those uh, cabins of disinfection and covering the city with polka dots uh, during those times that people could go out and about uh, to teach and use some uh, didactics on how do you keep a distance, what really is two meters. You know, people can't go with two meters uh, measurement in their hands, but once they see the signage that pretty much that gives them a sense of what is safe, um, then it really gets uh, on with life. Now, we are in a moment of reopening. Um, it is uh, it's a crucial moment to do this phased 
uh, in as we did the phase out from uh, uh, the pandemic. And I think the numbers so far are very promising. This was the first day when we only had one infection and hopefully it will uh, come down to zero and be a systematic uh, recovery. What are positive side effects that the crisis has had on Tirana? What needs to be done to obtain these positive effects? And what can Tirana learn from this experience? Well, you know, as we say, in every crisis there is a, there's an opportunity. And I think there's a few opportunities that rose from this uh, occasion. First, we got to experience what it means to live in a clean city. We got to discover our bikes. We got to discover our feet. Uh, sometimes we forget that cars have been with us only for the last 100 years. For millennia, uh, birds have flown, uh, fish have swam, and uh, humans have run or walked. Uh, this is our state of nature. We are runners and walkers. We're not meant to be sitting down in a metal box called the automobile. So going back to the basics uh, was phenomenal. And I think uh, it got us to realize that decisions that we can make ourselves, like for car-free days or to reduce the use of cars for distances less than one or two kilometers, are perfectly doable. And I think um, this was another opportunity to remind people that the pollution and the noise is up to us. We can resist city decisions to have car-free weekends or to reduce cars in some areas or to declare full swaths of downtown completely car-free are basically in our hands. So we don't need a pandemic to make forced decisions. We can basically do this. And I think it was a great opportunity to get stuff done that otherwise would have taken uh, forever to, to convince people. Right? We've done a lot of uh, this pedestrianization of the city and widening of, uh, of sidewalks and the addition of bike lanes. But now we've gone turbo on a lot of these changes because never in history have, have we seen such momentum of public opinion in favor of progressive uh, urbanism. And I think we will keep the course, but what we've done in five weeks, we weren't able to do in five years to double some of these, uh, some of these changes. A third thing we, we learned is that you can do more with less. You can um, be efficient working uh, uh, in the distance, for example, a lot of our specialists in the municipality, our urban planning department has done more in these two months than they would usually do for half a year. Because a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of useless meetings in, in sort of physical uh, interaction. Um, the mentality of the Balkans and the Mediterranean where, you know, people ask for a meeting for something that could easily be explained in, you know, a two minute phone call. Um, I think that level of efficiency was unprecedented for stuff that could really be done without much bureaucracy and endless, uh, endless meetings. And I think uh, the other lesson, technology is a lifesaver. And I think the, the expansion of Zoom and a lot of the applications for us to meet and to, to interact across distances, uh, saving ourselves useless car trips and useless hours going back and forth in traffic and occupying uh, public space uh, has been very efficient. So we want to see a lot of the city applications from Tirana Ime, which means my Tirana, uh, which is a platform for everybody to act like the mayor in their own little neighborhood. If they see something that is wrong, it can be fixed. They don't need to come and physically report it. They could just report it in an app. We know the exact GPS. We'll send a crew to fix it and we get it done without necessarily all the shuffling of, um, of the paperwork. And, but one of the most important lessons uh, was this unbelievable and unmatched and unprecedented network of solidarity. We said, look, we don't have a monopoly on social assistance. We don't have a monopoly on solidarity. We don't have a monopoly on charity. Unless everybody contributes, there is no way that we can track down, purely using our data, uh, who is a lonely uh, elderly person, who is a, a lonely granny or a grandpa. So other than doing our work with our social workers, so everybody who's on social assistance, everybody who's on disability, everybody who's uh, already identified as a lone retired person uh, that we took care of but then we found out there were so many people caught in between with borders closing and ferries and airplanes uh, shutting down that were stuck that otherwise were in perfect shape but they were stuck in this limbo with families separated so we had this network of young people who participated in this fantastic program called adopt a grandparent so adopt a granny or adopt a grandpa where you in that building, in that neighborhood, you know exactly that the elderly gentleman on the second floor 
was stuck alone because his kids only went for a weekend vacation to Greece or to Italy, but weren't able to come back because planes uh, were shut down. So this is um, a great lesson. And this is a huge network, an army of volunteers that we want to preserve. We had a major series of earthquakes last year, and this year we had a pandemic. You never know in this ever-changing world what could be the next challenge. But having in place this army of volunteers who already know who are the five people that they are uh, uh, chaperoning, uh, that they are catering to in that building block, and then they're calling to see if they have fever, if they have high blood pressure, if they need to pick up the medicine, or we, we can do the shopping for them, puts, up, puts us in a much better position to face such challenges in the future. You are investing in wider sidewalks and better public space. What needs to be done to further expand them? What are your next plans and steps after COVID-19? So, for example, already we have 50 kilometers of um, uh, bike lanes in the city. They are very nice, protected. But in a time of crisis, you don't really have all the time to do all the finishers, to do um, all the, you know, the beautiful stuff and all the artwork. Uh, you need to act fast, so pop-up bike lanes um, are a very easy solution. You know, lines and uh, you know, bars to separate them from the regular traffic so it feels safe and it's protected, uh, that is enough. So once we've already taken over this space, who otherwise was covered with idle parking cars, then we can go back and do them nicer and better. But in the beginning, since we have this consensus, might as well occupy as much space with this progressive urbanism as possible. And the same thing with sidewalks. Uh, there's a lot of urban legends like, oh, but business is going to go down. Well, it's untrue. Business actually goes up where people have more time, more space to walk. They spend more time uh, in these shops. Otherwise, it's a very, very narrow road and everybody's pushing elbows with everyone else. You're trying to get away as uh, soon as possible. Or if you have a huge line of metal uh, boxes, cold cars that are blocking the view from all the, the, the shop windows, you're not interested to see what's going on. Once you have this clear vista, once you have uh, the bike lane, that you don't feel you're being pushed away from the cars and wide sidewalks, uh, it's also better for business. And statistics and facts out there show that this is true. So my challenge to mayors, this is a crisis, but it's also a fantastic opportunity. Um, sidewalks, in my view, are the most democratic space um, in a city. This is where everybody's equal. In the, uh, in the uh, road, or in the highways, there's no equality. There are some people who have a fancy car and some people have a beat-up car. Uh, but the democracy that one achieves uh, in, uh, in a sidewalk, it doesn't matter what's your last name or what's your wealth status or what's the color of your skin or where you come from, everybody's sitting in the same level. And I think it speaks volumes that the amount of people who use their feet or their bike or public transport is much larger than car owners. And I think it's only about time, for democratic purposes as well, that this population who also pays the same amount of taxes also gets a proportional amount of road space and not necessarily have a minority of car drivers get 90% of the road space. And I think bringing a democratic uh, urbanism uh, is also one of the major lessons from this experience. How would a green, clean investment program for transport look like? Well, I think we are going uh, on fifth gear. Uh, to use a, a, a car driver's term um, on this investment. So at the moment, half of our taxi fleet has gone uh, electric. Uh, we're doubling the network of uh, bike lanes and connecting them. It's important that they are protected, but they are also connected. So you don't have beautiful segments and then you go out in the wilderness of, uh, of car races. Um, and the other thing that we're doing is we're boosting our tree planting program and also in our urban planning department, we're already designating other places, plazas, where we're going to take cars out, as well as make it permanent that on weekends, Tirana is a car-free city. And finally, I'd like to thank all of our um, friends from GIZ and all of our good friends from uh, Tumi TV for giving me this opportunity. Uh, we're so excited to work with GIZ on this, uh, on this concept. And a lot of what I just mentioned will be supported by their expertise and their urban planners and also some of the finances uh, that we need to implement some of these projects. So we're entirely grateful. No one can do this alone and we're happy to have fantastic friends on our side.
Thank you for this encouraging example. As soon as the situation allows, let's visit Tirana and have a look at the transformation. Let's welcome our next guest, Felix Weisbrich. He is the head of the Roads and Green Spaces office in Berlin. He believes that public streets and green areas play an essential role concerning the livability in cities. Recently, he constructed pop-up bike lanes within three days in his district. Das heißt auch für Radfahrende eigene Achsen anzulegen, auf denen sie sicher fahren können. Und ich sage es auch, die Leistungsfähigkeit des Verkehrssystems aufrechterhalten. Das heißt, wir brauchen zusätzliche Infrastrukturarten für Fahrradfahrende. Es ist einfach eine platzsparende Art, sich fortzubewegen im Gegensatz zu der platzverbrauchenden Art des Autos. Berlin hat schon vor dem Ausbruch des Virus sehr stark daran gearbeitet, den Modal Shift hin zum Laufen und Fahrradfahren zu bewegen. Seit dem Ausbruch des Virus aber haben wir eine wahnsinnige Geschwindigkeit gesehen, wie Dinge implementiert wurden hier in der Stadt. Was hat es Ihnen möglich gemacht, das so schnell auszurollen? Naja, wir haben hier in Berlin schon eine kleine Besonderheit. Wir haben das Berliner Mobilitätsnetz seit 2018. Das heißt, die demokratische Beschlusslage hat stattgefunden, baut diese Anlagen. Aber seitdem gibt es auch eine Debatte, warum passiert das eigentlich nicht? Wir haben diese Zeit aber auch genutzt, um die Verwaltung vorzubereiten und waren jetzt sozusagen zur Pandemie auch in der Lage, relativ schnell zu agieren und haben dann das einfach als Besteuerungsargument genutzt. Und wir haben das dann so getan, indem wir uns sehr schnell überlegt haben, wie kriegt man das so schnell in großer Fläche und Anzahl hin und haben da sogenannte Regelpläne gebaut. Wir haben nichts anderes gemacht als Mustervorlagen erstellt an Plänen, die man dann sehr schnell auf die Straße bringen kann und haben dann letztendlich einfach nur Markierungsfirmen angerufen und haben gesagt, könnt ihr uns das bauen? Die kennen das normalerweise von Baustellen und nichts anderes passiert ja auch. Es wird Geldmarkierung aufgebracht und es werden Barken gesetzt. Dann ist, der, dann ist der Effekt eines geschützten, getrennten Radweges sehr schnell da. Es ist aber nicht baulich umgesetzt, es ist sozusagen eine Baustelle. Und wir sagen auch, das Bild trifft auch zu, weil auf dieser Baustelle entsteht dann in einigen Monaten eine richtige und echte Radverkehrsanlage, fest und baulich. Aber der Effekt ist jetzt schon da. Neben Berlin sehen wir weltweit eine ganze Anzahl von Städten, die ebenfalls Pop-up-Bike-Lanes in ihren Städten ausprobieren. Was ist Ihr Tipp aus Berlin an andere Städte, um diese Maßnahmen zu vollziehen, aber auch permanent zu machen? Hab Mut und es muss einen gemeinsamen Willen geben in der Politik und in der Verwaltung, das zu tun. Argumente dagegen lassen sich immer finden. Wir sagen, wir haben hier ein sicheres, ein rechtssicheres Verfahren, auch ein verkehrssicheres Verfahren. Das, was in Deutschland, in Berlin geht, das geht woanders bestimmt auch. Da sind wir uns ganz sicher. Es braucht eben diesen Mut und es braucht dann letztendlich eine Verwaltung, die leistungsfähig ist und auch leistungsbereit, das umzusetzen. Und ich sage auch den Kollegen anderer Städte ganz klar, das ist auch eine Stunde, in der Verwaltung zeigen kann, dass sie unabkömmlich ist. Wann, wenn nicht jetzt, kann man zeigen, dass es eine starke öffentliche Verwaltung braucht. Wir nutzen das auch als Argument deutlich zu machen. Man braucht uns, spart uns nicht weiter kaputt, wie das lange Jahre leider passiert ist. 
sondern wir brauchen einen starken öffentlichen Dienst. I think it's great to finally have on the Cottbuser Dam uh, a bike lane so that we can safely bike here because uh, I live quite nearby here but in the past I used to avoid this street because traffic was so unsafe. So and it's great to see that we have this here now on the Cottbuser Dam. They are talking about also putting up a bike lane on the Hermannstrasse which is in this direction. So if we can keep this also after the corona crisis, I think that that would be great. Of course, being Dutch, I must say that there is still scope for improvement uh, in the quality of, of, of the bikeways. And I think that if Germany would follow the example of the United Kingdom, who are allocating two billion pounds for walking and cycling, then I think that here in Berlin, we could also come a long way in having really a safe city for cycling. So let's welcome our next guest from Madrid, Marta Serrano. She is an in mobility consultant for UATB and has been the first female director of Madrid Transport Company. Over to you, Marta. From the moment the alarm state was triggered, traffic level in many Spanish cities fell by 70%, reaching even 95% of mass transit demand. This reduction was also observed in some pollutants, such as nitrogen oxides, which decreased in the same amount, because its main source is basically from cars. As soon road traffic was shortened, air quality reached its best values for March and April, even in Madrid and Barcelona, where pollution is usually on dangerous levels at the time of the year. Nowadays, we are slightly recovering some activities, especially inside the neighborhoods, to go shopping or take a walk, and that is increasing the number of pedestrians on our streets. Many local governments, more than 40 at this moment, I think, are taking measures to facilitate the use of public space. But sadly, most of them take place only on weekends, considering walking or cycling like a leisure thing and not a real solution to day-by-day -day mobility. I think the main risk we are facing right now in Madrid is the risk to go back to the massive use of cars we had in the previous century. We cannot afford the massive traffic jump of 2-3 hours we have almost uh, forgotten. Instead, uh, we need to take this opportunity and take a look to other cities like London, Berlin or Paris. What are they doing? They are um, building uh, bike lanes, temporary bike lanes, they are bettering their public space, like enhancing pavements for, for pedestrians. But instead, in Madrid, we have uh, now free parking in the city center for first time in years. But if we really want to have a safer or more resilient mobility in the future after the crisis, we need to think in the public transport system. We need, first, we need to take along the produce uh, people 
are having now about the system, the public transport system. Um, and uh, improve all the system. We need to build new bus lanes here in Madrid. We, we don't have almost um, a lot of kilometers of bus lanes, but we need to improve the operation of metro system to attend the demand we we have in a daily basis, in a daily basis. But um, at the end, but what we need to do is uh, clearly advocate for sustainable mode in order to have the better possible future. With that realistic but also encouraging spirit regarding the future of public transport, we will now take a look towards a different part of the transport sector and switch once more back to Berlin. Our next guest is already transforming our cities towards more sustainability. She's introducing herself. We are a family-owned business. I run it with my sister. We work in railroad construction. We actually work around the tracks and we also provide CCTV and security systems for public transport. Public transport is essential to get goods to places but also to deliver the workforce. So, Cleaners, nurses, contractors, everyone that keeps the city going needs to be able to get to their work to actually do their work. In a city like Berlin, most of us don't even own a car. So if you stop public transport, you kind of stop the workforce. I think every crisis is a chance and we could use the time to develop our vision of what we want tomorrow to look like. The economic crisis, like the climate crisis, actually goes hand in hand. The economic crisis can only be fixed if we fix our climate crisis. What we think of today has to be sustainable to last tomorrow. And I actually believe we should start with public transport. We could use our vision of what we want mobility to look like and use this time now to develop a system that we can use the next 100 years. I actually think the construction workers out on the railroad tracks can give us a really good motivation because they now use the time that the trains don't run to rebuild the system. Now let's think about if we don't actually just invest in a system that's corroded and instead build something that we actually use for the next hundred years. I think it's a huge chance and we should definitely take the time, look at it, readjust and go forward. I'm very proud of my team during the time of this crisis because at the beginning, our whole workload, the way we work, the way we're allowed to work changed completely. But I have to say they lived up to it and actually superseded themselves. They used this crisis and came up with a lot of solutions that maybe I wouldn't have seen on my own. Um, as a company, we definitely evolved through this time. But I have to say we're also fortunate because we were able to continue working under strict security measures, of course, keeping our distance, wearing the face mask and definitely washing our hands at all possible times. What made our work special is that public transport slowed down a little, so we had more time to do our work right. I think that shows that sometimes in construction, it would be better to take the time and modernize systems completely than just to live with the quick fixes at higher cost. Thank you, Larissa. It is great that you and your team continue to work on the mobility transformation. With the right investments, companies like yours could build cities where the public transport is the backbone of mobility. To make get to school sustainable project is an infrastructure project being realized by Jetomer City Administration and supported by Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative. The project started in 2019 and it aims into uh, improvement of built environment in our cities and improvement of streets uh, uh, to promote active mobility of school children. So basically the project looks at the several locations in the city and uh, trying to figure out what's wrong with our streets and how can they be improved so the school children are more active and more sustainable in their choices uh, every day and their parents as well. 
Um, the good part of this project is actually that it uh, took the different perspective of involving uh, children and their parents and their teachers uh, into identifying what's wrong and uh, actually adding engineering and uh, inviting uh, city officials and professionals into this to actually make these improvements. So why it is even more important now during the outbreak of COVID-19 is actually that uh, this Ukraine is being now under quite st strict quarantine that is being um, uh, releasing uh, a little bit in May and what we understood that being uh, but schools are they are not returning until the next school year uh, and uh, we are seeing that actually school children with this very passive activity and very passive um, way of living now they are building new uh, habits and what we are worried is actually that returning back to schools uh, we might not see the improvement we wanted to see but actually we would have to do an extra uh, step an extra effort to ensure that school children are active and mobile and so this project becomes even more important because it puts even more um, attention to how the streets are organized and uh, uh, with this build with, with this uh, strong partnership with the schools that we already built even before this outbreak we can now actually work together with them to understand how we can address their needs better Apart from the main ideas with the project, which became even more important during this um, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we also took the resources of project to improve and to support cities uh, the way we can. So, uh, what else we did? We um, invited different um, bike shops and different maintenance providers and uh, mapped this into the Jutomer map that can actually tell people how they can and where they can repair their bikes during quarantine. Um, it is interesting that we now can see more people cycling uh, in Jutomer. It's also partially because there's limitations um, and uh, some restrictions on public transportation. Uh, and you can obviously see that some people, they are very new to the cycling. So it's actually supporting it and using this time to address those people is actually a very good time and we are trying our best and trying to be this uh, small connection uh, into the active modes in the city. Another thing that we also supported this uh, initiative that was uh, started by local office of GZ and Jitomer uh, webinars during pandemic um, and uh, we supported the transportation and mobility part of it and we also uh, doing it uh, together with our schools and we're sharing with them information and, and data and experience from uh, cities globally on how uh, you can improve your city or how you can improve your streets with tactical urbanism during this time and uh, we think this is very motivational and very nice and uh, while there are a lot of resources now available and uh, there are a lot of resources available in English, there are very few of them in Ukraine. And so our project is actually sharing this international experience that we also receive from Tumi Initiative as, as a partner of our city and project and sharing it with our city administration and with our project partners. To stick to the topic of cycling, enjoy our short video from New York before meeting us again for the webinar with Mike Leiden. There is no way you're going to get sick on the bike. You know, everybody should be biking. It's, it's the best alternative to commit. I mean, I always bike, but yeah, I think biking is probably the best way to avoid contracting coronavirus. I mean, it's always a better idea to bike. Biking's good. It, you know, screw the people who drive. We're taking cars off the street. It helps the air. It, it, it helps our own health. Every day on the bike, I feel you're healthier than even on the subway or any other form of commuting just gets you going. And so with coronavirus, sure, why not ride a bike, get fresh air, and not have anybody sneeze on you? But I might just take city bike instead, because close quarters, it's humid, sweaty. Join the party. I mean, it's a really great way to get to work. I think that um, when you see people out there, you feel like strength that there's community people out there. I think a lot of people who are looking for an alternative. I've been commuting for the last month because of coronavirus <laughs> and the scare. 
um, but it's not accessible to all and um, the infrastructure is also not accessible to all. I'm sorry, it's kind of infuriating for elected politicians who get driven everywhere to say, yeah, take a bike. And we have a lot of kids who can't do that and don't feel safe. And then when I hear the thing about um, just take a less crowded subway car, and I'm like, does this man ever travel in New York City? How, how are you going to get a less crowded subway car in rush hour? Yeah, I ride every day as is, but for sure I would be more hesitant to get on a subway. It's all about how hardy is your immune system, right? I'm out here year round doing this, breathing the dirt. I probably got a way harder immune system than everybody in my family. You're on your own here, you're in your own little bubble. You, know, you just have to be safe. It was crowded. I think there needs to be more space on the Queensboro Bridge. They should open up the other roadway. Too many people, people walking, close calls. It's very dangerous and I think it's only going to get worse. I beat my co-workers driving on a car from the same distance. We do this um, almost every day, five days a week. Um, all weather, so summer and winter, no matter what. Um, and I was doing it long before there was coronavirus or any reason to be concerned about um, you know, not taking public transportation, which I do you know, from time to time and I love it too. The subway can take anywhere from 25 minutes to like two hours and my bike commute takes 22 minutes every single time. Cycling is one of the things that we can do that can make a big difference for everybody. The more we ride, the more streets would be free of cars. I use city bike, I put 2,000 miles in it. Really? I did 2,344 miles. I burned 1,001 calories.